open in prayer. Father, thanks for the opportunity to gather, to think through the application of your word uh, as it applies to how we vocationally engage and relationally engage uh, the students and families we serve. Uh, thanks for all the folks in this room and their willingness to use their substantive gifts that you've given them and to submit to you and your call uh, and to open themselves to the power that you give them to engage and be part of your plan to present the gospel uh, and proclaim the goodness of your faithfulness uh, to so many people. Pray that this will be an encouragement even as we think about hard stuff uh, and bless our time in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, as I said, my name is Chad and I'll tell you this up front. I'm I'm in youth ministry, but in a little bit different way. Uh, I've been in Christian school ministry uh, for the last, essentially, 27 years. Uh, I currently serve as the, the president of Chattanooga Christian School, and I'm a, a fellow for an organization called CASE. It's, it's the Center for the Advancement of Christian Education. And in that role, I, I consult and I speak and, and do these types of things in different contexts. So I don't presume to be a master at what you do. I hope that you don't take anything from me that says, hey, do what I say and then everything will be fine. That's not what I'm here for. So the number of you in this room, there's supposed to be about 50 of you, is actually a little bit more than I had planned for uh, because I'd actually like you to participate in this conversation. So there's, there's some things that are really, really important to me and they have a lot to do with what, how I grew up in the church I grew up in a small, little 1,600-person town in northern Wisconsin called Oostburg. Uh, it was actually formed by Dutch settlers who were trying to get to Chicago for work, and their ship burned uh, to the waterline, and those that actually got ashore started this little community that I grew up in. So everybody was related to everyone. Uh, my mother and father were third cousins, and most of my friends growing up drove around with bumper stickers saying, if you're not Dutch, you're not much. So that might tell you something, and I'm not saying that's true, I'm just saying that's part of my heritage. But I also grew up in a church community uh, that was very significant to me, and not always in ways that I enjoyed. Uh, we went to church three times on Sunday, partially because my dad was a choir director, and we, we had to go to choir practice on Sunday afternoon. And every Wednesday afternoon, uh, after school, before our athletic games, uh, we had to walk to our churches, it didn't matter which church we went to, uh, but we walked to our churches and we had catechism class. And catechism class was from first grade to eighth grade. And every single Wednesday during the school year, we actually studied historic, reformed Christian catechisms. And I despised it. But there's something very significant about that upbringing. And, 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 and when, I, when I wrestle and struggle, or even when even when things are going very well, there's this thing in the back of my mind that keeps coming up. And it's, what is my only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong both body and soul to my, in, in, in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. So I believe that a lot of who I am today was formed as a result of the intentionality of the covenant community of God's people who taught me diligently, sometimes in very boring ways, how to understand and interpret God's Word in a way that when I was on my own and someone else wasn't around, or even when I was in the community of God's people and I was struggling with something that someone was teaching me, that I had a framework within which to understand all that I was wrestling with. So my, I, I attended Christian schools all my life, and I'm not here to sell Christian education to you. That's not what I'm here to do either. But I, but, but I lived in a world where in my junior and senior year in high school, my Bible class, the, 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 the book that we used, the curriculum that we used to study was Burkhoff's Manual of Christian Doctrine. Anybody familiar with that? Okay, wouldn't be something that necessarily I would choose for myself, but I'm still in Christian school ministry today. We would never even consider using Burkhoff's Manual of Christian Doctrine for a junior and senior group of students. Why? Wouldn't understand it. The biblical literacy of young people today is so different than even a decade ago that those of us that work in, in academic places and we wrestle with things continue to grow concerned. Now, we're not saying that's all laid at your feet, but we can't argue that the church is the center of our discipleship. Fair? 
So as we talk about this, I want to start with saying, here's some things that really concern me. And this goes to something that we're going to talk about later. These things really concern me. One is the shifting of church off-center. A decade ago, Gallup surveyed thousands of people and draw conclusions that the ratio of church attendance to time was one to one. One engagement in a local church community to one week. About a year ago, they surveyed the same or a, a similar demographic of people, and the ratio is still one to one. But instead of being one engagement in a local church a week, it's now one engagement in a local church a month. That's what's normative. So in 10 years' time, right, out of 52 weeks in a year, we've lost for that group of people how many contacts that include the proclamation of God's word, the exercise of the sacraments in a fellowship of a local church community. How many contacts have we lost? 36. So the reality of that has an effect, right? It has an impact on what we do on a daily basis, and it has an impact on the life of our children. So what does that do? We see a rapid decline in biblical literacy. Who's teaching the biblical narrative to students? Three years ago, I taught a senior seminar on the book, The Shack. Any of you familiar with that? We were dealing with heresy in the book. So we were doing a literary analysis of the book as part of a Bible and an English class in a seminar, and we were doing a theological analysis of the heresy in the book. And part of that study was about biblical reverence of a holy God. And, and I was talking about the story of Moses on Mount Sinai when God passed him by and he turned his back and the glory of God was so significant that when he went down the mountain, what had to happen? He was glowing so much the people from Israel couldn't even look at him. Over half the people in that section, now I teach in a Christian school, these are supposed to be church kids, didn't have any idea of the story that I was talking about. Didn't know the story to begin to frame what reverence ought to look like. So as we talk about reverence of a holy and righteous God, there's no framework within which for them to understand reverence and holiness except the culture in which they live. That has a very different view of reverence and holiness and righteousness than what Scripture teaches, yes? So the effects of biblical literacy decline are substantive. Then we also have a limited understanding of the alls of Scripture. Okay, I'm from the north, right? I said that. So when I say y'all, it probably doesn't sound right. But are you all familiar with the Texas Google Bible, Bible plugin that works with any online Bibles? Any of you familiar with that? Okay, so the, the whole context of that Bible plugin is what? Is that... What's that? It changes all the plural used to y'alls. I think I still have it up. Yeah, so Genesis 3 is up here. See all those y'alls? If you live in Pennsylvania, you could substitute y'alls for yins. And if you live somewhere else, you can substitute you guys. All right, but the reality is, and this guy, Joel J. Miller, he's a blogger. He actually wrote a really good article on this. And I'm going to come, I'm going to try to make this connection. So hopefully I don't lose you. But he wrote an article on the, the negative effects of the increase in the concept of personal faith. He did this Google analytic and he used the word personal faith. So all this digital writing, everything that's all now been combined in digital format, it searched all those words and looked for personal faith. There's a lot of writing throughout history about personal faith, right? No. Personal faith didn't start showing up in earnest in writing until about 1972. And then it took off like a rocket. And his argument is that corresponded with a me generation. It's not that faith isn't personal, but when we talk about it in an exclusively personal context, we're missing some of the substance of the whole counsel of God. That's why I like this so much. Because when you actually go and you change the plural forms of the verb to y'all, and you start realizing how many times we take passages and say you, meaning me personally, and it's talking to the people of God, right? It gives us a whole different meaning of the passage. So when I talk about as, as church shifts off center, the loss of understanding of biblical community, the y'alls of scripture, as individuals in an American culture that's very individualized, 
we begin to see Scripture and interpret Scripture out of the context of individuality. Could you agree that that has devastating effects? So then we look at this and we go to the second point which comes out of that concern, which is essentially this idea of rugged individualism. This is the American dream, right? You can do whatever you set your mind to. I was convinced that this was true when I was a young boy and loved basketball. I was convinced, loving Michael Jordan, that I could be Michael Jordan. But the reality is I could never be Michael Jordan because I was never going to jump like him. No matter how hard I tried, I was not going to be able to be that dream. So one of the biggest concerns that I have is the lie that you can be anything you put your mind to. Because I don't believe that's theologically correct. Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, all tell us that that's not theologically correct. That God, in his infinite wisdom and sovereignty, gave you some things and didn't give other people those same things, and he left some things out of you intentionally so that you could what? What would you be practically and pragmatically forced to do if you don't have every skill that you need for marriage, for child rearing, for life, for community? For co- what, what, what does that force you to do? Join with others. We're back to the alls of Scripture. But that's not an American ideal. So what do we have that comes out of rugged individualism? On the book table back there is a book by Chap Clark called Hurt. Or there's another version of it called When Kids Hurt. How many of you have read that? The, the summary premise of that book is, is that how do young people today feel about adults? They feel they have been... Yes, not just abandoned in a general term, but systemically. That young people today feel systemically abandoned by adults. Why is that? Because their identities are so wrapped up in their performance that they believe if their performance drops off even one bit, that the love of their parents, of those adults in their lives, are going to be withheld from them. Because their identity is primarily wrapped up in their performance. My argument is that's a natural result of an individualistic culture. If I can be anything I want to be, if I don't be that, then there's something wrong with me. Then we have safety nets. Okay, why would I say safety nets? What do you think the connection is there? (laughs) I, I lead a parent seminar about once a month and say, put a picture up and say, put your child's image in there. What do you want your child to look like? What are the characteristics that you want in your child when they grow up? The number one thing they tell me, this is the truth, is I want them not to be living in my house when they graduate from college. Okay, but here's the reality. If my, if my identity's in my performance and I fail, how do I feel about that? I feel terrible. So if I'm a loving parent and my child fails and they feel terrible, what am I likely, naturally going to want to do? Put a safety net underneath them so they can't fail. I have a substantive concern that young people today have such tight safety nets, six inches from their fall, placed in their lives that they don't ever have to experience real disappointment. Because any type of disappointment when you have a safety net makes you a victim. And if I'm a victim every time I have disappointment and I have to deal with that disappointment, what happens when I don't have to deal with that disappointment on my own until I get married and I realize that marriage isn't only about romantic love? What happens to me? I have no capacity in which to deal with that disappointment. So what would I naturally do? I feel like this is being done to me. Whatever disappointment I feel is being done to me, so my natural reaction is going to be to step back from any of that level of disappointment. Then we're over-programmed. So if my identity is in performance and we put in all these safety nets, then what do I have to do to make sure my children are successful? I over-program them. Let me give you an example. I have to leave here pretty quick after this is over because I have to get to a basketball game that my daughter, eighth grade daughter, is playing in. Because she's an eighth grade girl playing on a high school basketball team. Well, Sunday, I didn't get to go to church 
Because at 11 o'clock, when worship was being held, that same eighth grade daughter had a club soccer game. And we took her to the club soccer game because after all, what would have the greater negative consequence? Me missing church one time or the wrath of her coach because she didn't show up for a big game. Now, mind you, I just told you that she's also playing high school basketball. So please don't see me as one who stands back and says, I have this all figured out and I never contribute to the problem. I'm probably one of those parents that you hate because my kids aren't attending youth activities because they're doing something else. And they're in every AP class that you could possibly take because after all, it's really important that they get the right scholarship to the right college because that makes a difference in the success of their life. You ever heard that story before? The reality is it's not just the secular world that engages in these practices. The secular world has crept into a church in such a way that even as I'm standing up here, I'm justifying those decisions. All right, so if that's the reality, what do we do about it? Well, first thing I want to do is say we don't just stop there because there's a great article that I think is the best place for us to start. So, if this whole idea of, of church has shifted from once a week to once a month, there are still people who are in church. Gallup says that 60%, they actually say 59, so I've rounded up to make my point, but 59% of millennials and younger, that's most of you, right? 59% of most of you and younger who are in church today will not be in church 10 years from now. 59%. This is not 59% of people who say they're believers and don't go to church will not be believers. This is 59% of the people in your pews today won't be in church 10 years from now. But there are still people there. Why are they there? What's the first thing of this article say? They're converted. What does that mean? God's promise is true. God's sovereignty is real. God's covenant promise is not just a myth. That God's faithfulness means we persevere in our, in our faith. That those whom God has redeemed, He's justified. Right? So why do we have people in our churches? Because God's really doing the work He said He was going to do. So before we go anywhere else with this conversation... We need to stop and say, God is faithful, and this, all this stuff, all this evidence is not evidence that God's less faithful. All these big theological concepts that we believe at RYM, they're still all true. But why else are there some people that stay in church? And these are really important for all of us. What does that say? Somebody else read that. They've, they've been equipped, not entertained. Okay, see right here, not, not the Alabama fan that's sitting in the front row, but the thing that he's sitting at is a multi-billion dollar industry. Why, why would I say that? What relevance would that have to my conversation today? This desk is a multi-billion dollar industry. What's significant about the desk that you all are sitting in? The front two rows, unlike the back rows. What do the desks do? They connect. Individual decks connect and they make circles that have little cutouts that you can get closer. Why are they selling so many of these desks to places like my school? Because kids that are in our school want to connect. They want to sit in circles and they want to wrestle with really significant things. I grew up in the 80s and listened to big hair band music that the lyrics had no real substance. Kids today listen to music that is literal poetry. It may be secular poetry. It may be teaching things that we don't want them to learn, but they care about big stuff. They're not apathetic about real critical ideas. They care deeply about things like social justice. So they make desks so that we can put them in organizations and not instead of rows, that we put them in circles where they can be communities and they can come together. 21st century schoolhouses have as many fireplaces as they do science labs. I'm not kidding. Because it's creating spaces where kids can get together and actually wrestle with ideas and think collaboratively and work together and solve problems. They want to do these things. We need to equip them. They actually do want to be equipped. 
And they actually see right through entertainment that has no substance. But here's the problem. If they come home one day and they don't like one of your gatherings and they tell your, their parents that this is really boring, what might likely you hear? That you have to be more entertaining. That's not to say the struggle's not there, but the reality is, what my argument is, the image of God in the students you serve that's creative and desires to wrestle and solve and is meant to be agents of reconciliation, not the enablers, but agents to participate in God's plan to make all things new. That's there, and they want it to be of substance. And the kids that are staying in churches in their 20s and in their 30s have found that substance in their formative years, and that's what they're looking for. Here's what else we know about kids that stay in church. What does that say? Their parents teach them the gospel. I would say this a little bit differently. I would say that their parents live the gospel. The reality is, and sometimes I use this as a justification, but I tell my children, look, you all need to understand it's, it's, it's part of a sinful, broken world that causes your mommy and daddy to fight. The worst thing in the world is not that they fight and they disagree. The worst thing in the world is if we're not repentant and if I, as my wife's husband and the father of my children, am not genuinely and authentically re as repentant or more repentant in the context of my children, that I am telling my wife how she's wrong and I'm right. And it actually is better that those conversations sometimes happen out in the open than when we brush them under the carpet and we won't deal with really complicated and difficult things. So it's not just that they proclaim the words of the gospel. It's that they see the gospel. I started in Christian education 27 years ago. I had a combined 7th and 8th grade class at a, at a school that was a ministry of a Presbyterian church in the Chicago suburbs. During the first year that I was there, over the concept of sonship, our church split. And every single one of those middle school students that I was teaching that were members of that church, not a single one of them is in church today. And if you ask them why they're not in church today, what will they likely say? that when they were standing in the balconies of their homes and putting their little heads through the spindles of the railing and listening to what their parents with their friends that were over were talking about, they were listening to things they were saying about the church that made them in their formative years be thinking, the last place that I want to be to find nurture and safety and security and vertical and horizontal relationships that glorify the Creator is in the context of a local church. So it's not just telling them systematic theology, although I think those things are important. It's not just helping them understand the nature of redemption and the fall and original sin, although I think those things are really important. It's allowing them to live that stuff out. So my encouragement to you is you don't just have to reach students. Who else do you have to reach? Parents. Now that's incredibly hard. Number one, because in the American institutional church, we've divided all these things into compartments, yes or no? For the sake of what? My argument would be relevance, convenience. I'm not saying this because I'm right and I'm not saying this because I'm really good because I'm really not. But my children never attended children's church. Now, if your church has children's church, I'm not criticizing you. My wife and I made a conscious decision that there was something substantive about what was happening in the proclamation of God's Word in corporate worship on Sunday morning that my children needed to participate in even if they couldn't fully access the information that was being proclaimed because who is it that impresses the truth of God's Word on the heart of our children? The Holy Spirit. So does the Holy Spirit require that word to be completely accessible to impress it in the heart of a child? Is it possible that in our desire to be relevant, we've split things up so much that our students and our children don't understand the nature of how God's bound us together? 
And how you can't miss what happens in the Old Testament and see multi-generational groupings. That the young and the old are learning together. You can't read Deuteronomy 6 and say that's all separated. So how... So what do we do about that? Because here's what happens to me. And again, I'm just talking about my context because I don't know yours. 85% of the families that attend the school that I lead, and we have 1,200 students, 85% of our families, both parents work outside the home full time. Over half of our students are dropped off at 7.30 in the morning and don't get picked up until 6 o'clock at night. And it's not always because we fill them up with activities. It's because we have to have activities so that the children have a place to go because their parents are still at work. Now you may say that's all my fault because we charge such high tuitions it forces them to have to work. But here's my argument. Private school, no private school. Would you say that the majority of your families, both of the parents work outside the home? Does that make it more difficult for you to get them to engage with you as you seek to disciple and nurture and educate their children? You understand what I'm saying? So if that's the reality, we're not just sitting here saying, okay, woe is me, this is a terrible thing, there's nothing we can do about this, because God's still sovereign, He's still doing His work. We may have to adapt the way we think about this to reach the students and the families that we serve. Fair? Fair? Gallup has some interesting information. Well, let me start with this. um, R.C. Sproul's group, Legionnaire Ministries, just commissioned a survey by Lifeway. If you go on Legionnaires.com, you'll find it. It's in a wonderful infographic form that looks like this. That's what this is up on the screen. Okay, the majority of Americans perceive goodness to be a better description of people than sinful. The majority of Americans believe that goodness is a better position or a better description of people than sinful. For the first significant amount of time that I was driving here from Chattanooga this morning, I was on the phone with a parent who had gone through the teacher and the high school principal and now had gotten to me. She was furious. Her daughter, who's the president of her youth group, was removed from class because she was talking to another student, was asked by the teacher three times to stop talking, so the teacher just finally said, hey, if you're not going to listen to me, you can go sit outside of class. I'm not saying the teacher was perfect. I'm not saying they were right. The other child that was involved in the talking has admitted, yes, I was talking the whole time. This mother's premise was, my daughter's the president of her youth group. She's a good kid. She wouldn't lie. She didn't talk because she told me she didn't. So your teacher's an idiot. Real words. Now, that may sound like a straw man, but the reality of that is, right, a fundamental deception that comes back to a basic theological premise of original sin and total depravity. My daughter can't be telling me the truth because she's a really good person. Why? Because I think people are basically good. And there's something entirely wrong with you if you would claim that my daughter is fundamentally scarred, affected, marred by sin. Now, I guess I could have had a conversation with that parent on the phone, and I could have described the doctrine of total depravity, but I'm not sure that would have gotten me anywhere. One of, the, one of the most enjoyable things that I get to do right now is teach an adult teaching group at North Shore Fellowship a PCA church that that I attend. And we're talking through catechism. And I'm going to show you a distinctive way that we're doing it. So we're walking through catechism questions. And we're trying to do it in a way that harkens back to the days of old of Socrates. How did Socrates teach? Ask questions. They talked. Learning was at the foot of the master. It was asking critical questions and leading them to process answers. There was a depth to it. Now, there were some significant factors that are different than what we had today. They didn't have paper. So you couldn't go read the book. And as a matter of fact, if you look back at that time in history when paper came into existence, all of those scholars were convinced it was going to be the end of learning because this new technology was going to be so distracting and people weren't going to learn. And what does that point to? It's the same question I hear today about technology, the same concerns I hear about technology. It's better that we read the book in paper than it is in digital format because the digital formatting is way too distracting. There really isn't anything new under the sun. But the reality is 
what we're trying to do is get people to think back to some really critical ideas. And it's great that we have God's Word in common languages so we can read it for ourselves, but it's also great if we wrestle with these really big ideas. If we think through the consequences of what Scripture is teaching and what does that actually mean. You understand, that's what the Westminster Confession is. That's what catechisms are. That's what catechesis is. It's just the asking of critical questions and the wrestling with big answers and using Scripture to form the foundation for what that answer really is. So how many of you in your youth groups today teach the Westminster Confession as the substance of your youth group teaching times? Why not? If we understand that the world today has a declining biblical knowledge, and we understand that theologically we're drifting to think that it's not original sin isn't really true because people are basically good, why are we not teaching core ideas of the Christian faith to young people today? If they want to be deep, if they want to wrestle with big ideas, if they want to find out and understand meaning. I'm not saying that the Westminster Confession is more important than Scripture. I'm saying that the content of the confessions and catechisms help us understand what Scripture as a whole is trying to teach us. It teaches us the whole counsel of God. It forces us to look at all of Scripture to try to understand what's true. Otherwise, what do we have a tendency to do? We pick and choose passages to justify our positions. So this works better when there's only 10 people in the class because people are more likely to talk. But why is it that not many of us are likely to do this in our youth activities? And I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. Boring, foreign. Do we think it does? Do we think that what's written in the catechism, I think that's a legitimate question. I'm not criticizing your question, but this is the starting point. Do you believe that the substance of what's in those catechisms and confessions has an influence, a bearing, forms the foundation for how our students live their lives? If, if we don't understand justification if we confuse justification and sanctification, right? There's all kinds of really interesting battles happening within the PCA over this whole issue of justification and sanctification, right? Third use of the law, right? Yeah, Tullian, all that other stuff, right? So as adults, we all get all wrapped up in these discussions and we call each other names, right? Works righteousness camp on this side, antinomians on this side, right? The reality is that is what we have a tendency to think about systematic theology. That it's just some kind of lofty idea that has no bearing and no substance on my life. But here's the bottom line, folks. If I understand that God pursued me while I was dead in my trespasses and sins, and while I was dead in my trespasses and sins, and that deadness means I was rejecting Him. I was saying, Creator God, I'm choosing to serve me instead of you. I'm choosing to reject you to serve myself. Look, I love my wife to death. She's a wonderful woman to put up with me for 20 years. But if she overtly said, I'm choosing to reject you to only care about myself, I'm not certain that I would sacrifice much that was meaningful to, her, to me to draw her back into a right relationship. But God, who's, I love my wife to death, but is way greater than her. I rejected him and he still pursued me and he didn't come to me when I was made right. He came to me to make me right. Does that change the way I look at the world? Does it change the way I deal with disappointment? Does it help me be more humble when I look at somebody who doesn't have it all figured out when I think I really do? It ought to. Because I'm not better than my neighbor because I fixed myself. For some reason, in God's infinite mercy and grace, He chose to rescue me from the condition of my sin. 
My argument is that changes everything. It changes absolutely everything. If I believe that I was in a pit in my sin and God said, here's a ladder, crawl out on your own, right? He gave me the ladder, I couldn't get out, but I crawled out on my own. That leads me to a very different world in life view. If I believe God reached all the way down and picked me up out of the pit and he picked me all the way up and I didn't have any choice. I realize that sounds really difficult and it's really complicated and it can be controversial, but is it relevant to what I do on a daily basis? Okay, be honest. When I said that, was that really boring? Do we think that, that it's right that our kids really want to deal with substantive stuff? then what's the real reason we don't do it? And I'm not necessarily asking you, that's a rhetorical question, but I think it's the most critical question that you all face today. Because I think the pressure put on you is ridiculous. And I think people like me who have their kids involved in all kinds of other stuff so they don't go, they're hurt, we're hurtful. Because what we're really saying is all that stuff is more valuable than what you're doing. And I get it. I know it's really hard. I don't want to discredit that in any way, shape, or form. I think your jobs are incredibly difficult. And it amazes me that 130 people would come together and talk about how to do this in a way that doesn't shine a light on you, but shines a light on Jesus. I think that's amazing. So I applaud you for even being here and engaging in this. But I do think these are really critical questions that we have to think about. So I want to offer you some alternatives and say, hey, how can we deal with this? And, and they may not work, and they may be stupid, but I just want to try. Is that fair? Any of you know what that is? Yeah. New City Catechism. How many of you have heard of the New City Catechism? Okay, so remember I told you I have this privilege of teaching an adult Sunday school class, a teaching group, and we're walking through catechism. This is what we're using. And we chose this intentionally. All right, the New City Catechism, I would say, is broadly reformed, right? It's not as confessionally or historically reformed as we would find in the Westminster Confession of Faith, although there are Westminster Confession questions in here. The first one happens to be my favorite. I already referenced it. I'm a Dutch guy, I'll admit. I'm a little more fond of the Heidelberg Catechism. It's way more personal to me and maybe to you than the Westminster Confession. I, I, there's something about what is my only comfort in life and death versus what is the chief end of man. There's something about that that I'll admit that draws me to that more often. But what we're doing here is we're putting this out here, and here's the beauty of a new city catechism. It's in a new form. So if I'm teaching adults, what's that right up there? A video. There's a two-minute video, two to three-minute video on every one of the how many questions? How many questions in a new city catechism? 52. Why is there 52? Because there's one every week. So they're breaking these conversations down into bite-sized pieces. And there's guys like D.A. Carsons, who I think is fantastic theologically, who does a three-minute video on stuff. So you don't have to listen to me. You can listen to him. And, and it's not just a video. It also has commentary. So practically, we can help people understand what's the value of biblical commentary? What's the value of really bright theologians who have tried to figure out what this passage actually means? It gives us some help interpreting the passages, so it teaches us how to potentially use biblical commentary. It also shows, and this is more important, that's why it's first, it shows the verses that the answer comes from. That we're not elevating confession and creed over Scripture itself. Well, here's the even cooler part. And you might not think this is cool. You might just think I'm weird. But there's a child's version that's embedded within the program itself. Because my guess is, is that a five-year-old isn't going to think that D.A. Carson's is so exciting as I think D.A. Carson's is. Okay, but here's what a five-year-old will do. They really like silly jingles. So for every catechism question, there's two or three jingles that kids could sing that are reflecting either the verses that are in the commentary that form the basis for the answer to the question or the answer itself. And then you can track your progress. 
And you can do it on your iPhone or a Droid phone. And you can do it on your iPad or a Droid tablet. Or you can do it on a computer. Or if you don't like technology, you can print off the PDF and you can just walk through the questions reading it on paper. But I got to tell you, there's 50 people in my teaching group. I would say five of them in a PCA church, five of the 50 have been through any type of catechism or confessional discussion. Think that's fair? Think that's potentially accurate or you think I'm building a straw man to make my point? Do you think that would be similar to what would be happening in your churches? If it is, then you all, not just the elders of your church, although I think they ought to be involved, ought to think through, we're credo and confessional churches. So how do we work through all this? In the last section, there was only 12, so there was a lot more talking by you instead of me. So we were talking through, well, what do we do about this? And one of the guys in the group said, you know what, I just got to be honest and confess this. I feel tremendous guilt about asking parents to do anything because they're so busy. I don't even know how to go about all this stuff. Any of you feel like that? But if we go back to the original article that we talked about, there are people still in church. Kids are still in church. Millennials, of which 60% of them won't be in church 10 years from now, but there'll be 40% that are. One of the primary factors that will cause them to still be in church is what? Parents teach the gospel to their children. And they were equipped, not entertained. It's kind of funny. I do a seminar for parents once a month. And it's the same thing. I just invite different parents. And I put a picture frame up on the screen. And I say, take your child 20 years from now. What are the characteristics you want to see in your child? <laughs> this is the truth. It's kind of funny. The, the thing they most say is, I want them to have a good enough job that they're not still living in my house. That's what they most often say. But but second thing they say is, I want them to be involved in a local church. I want them to know Jesus, and I want them to be in a church. So what are the things that are most likely to keep that child in the church? That's what I ask them. If that's what you're really looking for, then what are the inputs that God gives us grace, right? The lifelines of God's grace by which he demonstrates his faithfulness to us. What are they? Oh, you mean Deuteronomy 6 is true. You mean the promise of Deuteronomy 6 that when we teach our children as if there's frontlets in their eyes and put them on the signposts along the way, that when we really do that, you mean, really, your faithfulness through that means it's more likely that my children will still then be in the church when they're adults, not because of my work, because of yours, but you work through that work? That's what you command us to do? You mean that's true? Your promise is true? Yeah, it really is. So we believe God's promises are true, right? You came to Reformed, this is RYM, stands for Reformed Youth Ministry, right? So we're reformed, right? So we believe in God's faithfulness, right? We believe in God's sovereignty, right? So if we believe God's sovereignty and we believe these are things he teaches us, that out of the overflow of the abundance of our joy in him, that to be obedient means we teach our children these types of things, then why don't we do it? How many of you use Twitter? Well, that was a pretty... Okay, I use Twitter as professional development. And, and I want to, you know, this just lit literally in between sections, I pulled up a piece on Twitter. Let's see if I can find it. I'm also a big Evernote fan, just in case you want to know where I'm getting this out of. Th this literally just came up on Twitter in between classes. What does that say? Christianity cannot survive the decline in worship. That's a beautiful article. I would have never known about it if it wasn't for Twitter. Okay, so I'm not sitting here telling you that Twitter is going to save the world. But last night, while I was watching something else on television, I participated in a Twitter chat that used the hashtag chat, tech, chat. C-H-A-T-T, -T, so Chattanooga, technology, chat. It was an educational group talking about technology. We used that hashtag. So that hashtag did what? What did that allow me to do? Follow the entire cycle. 
So during that hashtag, 400 people got into this group and were sharing ideas about how we could better integrate technology in a classroom while keeping teacher-student relationships at the center of the educational experience. That's the whole ethos, whole primary purpose of this group. How do we, how do we harness the value of technology while keeping student-teacher ratios or student-teacher relationships at the center of the learning experience? 400 people participated in this chat, and at the end, the cur courier of this group used another app that put all of the tweets and all of the links inside of a storyboard so I could print it off and take it later or use it later if I couldn't keep up with everything. Now, what if we started a hashtag, my only comfort? How many of your students probably use Twitter? How many of you think you have a lot of students that use Twitter? Now, what if we couldn't get them to use group, but we started my only comfort? And instead of having discussion inside of a room, we invited part people to participate in that room. Not perfect, not suggesting that we should have a thousand friends, but no real relationships, which is what social media does. I'm not suggesting that. But what if we use it as a tool with crazy busy kids who want to talk about serious stuff to get the conversation started? Most of the time when I teach in groups like this, I use something called today's meeting. Any of you familiar with what that is? It's, called, it's a back-channeling site. Do you know what back-channeling is? It would allow you anonymously to be posting comments about what I was talking about, and it would show up on the screen without you having to raise your hand and ask a question. So it would either allow you to raise a question, or sometimes they criticize me. That's the risk you take is sometimes they put stuff up there that's really embarrassing, but it helps the conversation to be really authentic when there's barriers in between the room and there's a lot more of you than there is of me and I like to talk. So you think, well, he told us he wanted to have a conversation with us, but he didn't stop long enough to allow us to speak. This gives us a chance to, and you feel more comfortable because your name's not even associated with it. Right? Would you feel more comfortable asking me questions if you could do it anonymously and I could just read them and I didn't know it was you? Would you? Do you think your students are any different? You might think that they're, they, they have all this bravado, but they don't. Not when it comes to these deep and serious things. They might be disrespectful. They might act like they have it all figured out. But what if we created vehicles to start the conversation, right? Those icebreakers that we all probably still use, those funny games that make us feel really foolish. Do you ever use those? What if we just used, what if we just inserted this type of thing into one of those conversations? What if we engaged a whole church with the New City Catechism and said, we're just going to do this one piece at a time. And we just want you to take five minutes or ten minutes to work through this with your family. Because there's a part that will work for your teenager and there's a part that will work for your five-year-old. How was the temple or the tabernacle in Israel oriented in the life of the community? Center. Okay? How are the tents then aligned? The doors all open the temple. And was it all the young people in one part and all the old people in another part? When Josiah found the book of the law and he celebrated the Passover according to the Bible like no one had celebrated since the time of David. What were the characteristics of celebrating the Passover like no one had celebrated it since the time of David? Old people and young people were worshiping together. If we use an innovative tool like the New City Catechism to get our families to spend five or ten minutes wrestling with big concepts and asking and answering these big questions, and they might all learn to, sit, to sing a jingle together, or they might all watch a video, might that open up the door for you to have some conversations with your students that could potentially be more substantive? Might that break the ice? If we were willing to engage in the activities that our students engage in, like Twitter, and open up this type of chat and invite people to participate and take a risk and post first, what is my only comfort, and then post the answer, and then you share in 140 characters your ideas, even if you're the only one. You might be the only one posting, but there might be 10 other kids listening 
that wouldn't be in the room if you were doing this in a class. All I'm suggesting is, are there ways for us to engage that look differently that we've never thought about before that would allow us to get to not fluff just because it's social media, but get to the heart of this deep, significant concept that teaches us about the heart of a God who loved us enough to send his son to redeem us, not because we fixed ourselves. And to teach our students that God's faithfulness means we do persevere in our faith until the end. Does that make sense? Do you think your students understand that? So that's what I'm trying to get at. Anybody have any thoughts? Anybody risk raising their hand and adding to this conversation with 58 people in the room? I know you've had a lot. It's 445 almost. Thoughts? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, James K. Smith, anybody know what book? He's written some books, the ones he's speaking of about liturgies and the things we love. It's imagining his kingdom, right? So his idea is we are what we love. He talks about the liturgy of the mall. Now, that probably doesn't make sense for most kids today anymore because they don't go to the mall. The mall is dead. But the idea is you go to the mall over and over and again because of what you love. So we are shaped by what we love and we are shaped by what we do again and again and again in that practice, and we're by nature those types of people. There's a lot more to it than that. But it's a great book if you haven't read one before. I appreciate you pointing that out. But I do think there's something substantive when we do these things, when we exercise the discipline to engage in these topics about very difficult things that sometimes can seem boring, that there is growth and development that comes from that. Do we tell our kids that they don't have to worry about learning calculus because it's boring? I, you understand the question I'm going to ask next, right? You, you snicker when I say that, but we would never say that, would we? But, but again, what causes us to back away from these things in the context of our ministry? I'd love to have an understanding of that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, acquisition of these types of things at young ages, I mean, all the science and all the literature says our young children are capable of a lot more than we think they are. But I think he, and I'm going to come to you in just one second, but I think that he made a really good point that I think is really critical for us going forward. I I do believe there's a, and you all may think I'm wrong in this, there's a very practical, pragmatic part of Ephesians chapter 4 in the concept of God put some things into you as bearers of his image and he left some things out. Why, why would I say that? What's so significant about that? What, what does that force you then to do? If you don't have all the, 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 the fundamental skills and talents to do all the work that God needs done, what does that force you to do? Yes, it, it, you, there's a dependence on your vertical relationship with him, right? Because we can't do this. We're not fully equipped. We don't have everything that comes. But there's also a dependence on your vertical relationships. The alls of Scripture are made practically real in the context of that. I do think there is an importance of all of us getting together and saying, as a church of God's people, old and young, if we'll all commit to breaking these things down and wrestling with these complicated truths that have substance in our lives, if we do it together, it has more meaning and it's more long-lasting. Seminary, 
they are scared because they feel like they are not properly equipped. Um, but they don't realize that they are. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, going back to your question, um, fear of lack of knowledge. Um, and, you know, maybe even, you know, a little bit of, maybe lack of, lack of theological training. Um, you know, for me, um, you know, pre-seminary, I know that, like, some of my lessons were probably like, this is sort of very legalistic and seems more like a good tip on how to, how to get through the day more than what is this actually about. Yeah, and my guess is there's probably people in this room that haven't had the privilege of, or may never have the privilege of attending seminary that may feel ill-equipped, and it may be why you're here. But I think there's connections that you all make together uh, that can also help support each other. Uh, my wife listens to sermons by a guy named Ian Hamilton. He's Scottish, um, uh, out of Cambridge Presbyterian Church. You can find podcasts on him. He's a phenomenal exegeter of the gospel. Uh, and he talks a lot about the fact that a decline in theological knowledge in Western culture has caused us, because we don't know what we're for, we spend most of our time defining what we're against. That, that the reality of, that, that the way that we're viewed as, as Christians in a secular world is mostly what we're against, is because we have no concept of how to really deeply describe what we're for. So I'm not advocating for or against seminary. I'm just saying some of this is to figure out graciously how can we, as, as lay folks that need to continue to grow in our understanding of the gospel, how can we build networks of people where there's safety in wrestling with these types of questions? And, and I think that's a lot of what RYM is trying to accomplish, right? Is to get you connected to networks where you can learn this. But again, I would say that burden to grow and that knowledge, I think is something we have to discuss as a whole church. So it doesn't go to everything you said, but... Um, yeah, that, that's a really good question, and I don't think I have a very good answer. Um, I, I, again, I think, I think they, they ought to be taught together. I, I think adults ought to see the children's catechism, and children ought to see the adult catechism, because I think it helps us in a broader understanding of each other. Now, I, I think that what's likely to have a greater impact on an adult is not the jingle that's in the children's catechism, but, but I don't entirely believe that the language, it might be that an adult finds it easier to access the truth of the catechism by reading the children's version. That makes sense? Now remember, I'm coming from a context of saying that I read Deuteronomy 6 and other passages like it, saying God's intent was that it's the community of God's people that educates each other. I grew up in a schooling community that had everything from daycare to a retirement community on the same piece of property. I'm not, that's not a joke, that's the truth, because it was a cradle to great education. So it was important for the kindergarten and preschool students to go visit those that were in retirement communities, but it was important for the people in the retirement communities to come help the students that were in the preschool. And, and I, I, again, I might be wacky, but, but I think that, that is God's practical, pragmatic, tangible design of the way that he's oriented us together as a people. Well, and I, you just, it, a lot of what you said resonates uh, as truth. And, and, and the reality is, I, I actually think that's a very effective way to instruct. Um, and, and I think part of it is they, they, they can all get it, right? So, so I know I can access the content that's there. I don't have to look foolish uh, in the middle of it all. It breaks it down uh, into appropriate parts. Others? 
Well, we're at 6.45, or excuse me, it's not 6.45, it's 4.45. Um, and look, I want to tell you this. I want to go back to where I started. In all of this conversation, my desire is not to say, hey, what in the world's wrong with you? Why don't you do this? My desire is to say, these are important questions to wrestle with. And I know there's a thousand other things that you all have on your plates because of the nature of your job. So I don't want you to walk out of here saying there's something wrong with you if you don't take this and implement it. My desire and my hope is all this information, what it does is it helps us kind of codify what maybe ought we be doing, and then we can just nibble on that for a little while and then start thinking about, okay, how can that actually happen? Not all your church relationships are the same. Not, not all your cultures are the same. So that, that has an effect on all this too. I just think, and the reason I'm here is to say, there are some innovations that could help you make this simpler, more digestible, more accessible, but then there's also just teaching it. It's also having the courage to grow together and be willing to teach it. So thanks for your attention. I know you've all had a long day, but you've been great. Uh, have a great rest of the day.